have a Bible, look down with your neighbor, and then right after church, run down and buy a Bible as fast as you can. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. God is very concerned about this whole oneness thing. First of all, that we are one with Him, right? And the question this morning is, are you one with God? That's the most important question. And then the one right behind that is, are we one with each other? And if you're married, are you one? Are you one? That, that, that struggle, that battle, that challenge goes from Genesis to Revelation. And at the end of Revelation, what does it say? We all become one. And it's a beautiful thing. So the first commandment that God is always giving his people is to be one with him, to love him with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. And, and, and God being God is not only concerned about us, but he's also concerned about our kids. And so he always says, and make sure you talk to your kids about this. And make sure they know how great I am. Is it because God is insecure and needs praise all the time? No. Because we need to know how great he is for our sake. And our kids need to know how great he is for their sake. So he says, talk about him all the time when you're getting up, when you're, when you're, when you're at Starbucks, talk about God. When you're, when you're getting up in the morning, when you're driving at work, when you're sitting at your desk, any chance you've got, you get his point, right? Write it on the walls, not in Sharpies, but, you know, put it on a paper or something and, and, and make sure everybody knows. That's his first concern always. Chapter 7, verse 3. And he's making his people, he's getting his people set up here. This is after they've come out of Egypt and, and he's creating his nation. And in verse 3 says, talking about the other people of the land, he says, do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods and the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. This is what you are to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their asherah poles and burn their idols in the fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord, your God. The Lord, your God, has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. This was a command from God to his people. Why? Because he wants them with him to be different, to be set apart. And he knows what will happen if they give their hearts to the people of the world. They will pull you out, is what he's telling them. Oh, God just doesn't believe in me. No, God knows me. He knows us. And he knows us that if when we give our hearts away, it's almost impossible to pull it back because the heart is out of control. And he knows what will happen. You know, there's a popular idea out there, evangelistic dating, it's called. Helping people to know God through dating. Garbage. What ends up happening is the world pulls people out of God's kingdom. Number one reason women fall away from the Lord. Dating. Guys in the world. Number one reason guys in the church fall into sin. Women in the world. And God knows that. He knows how weak we are. So right from the very beginning, he told his people, don't do it. Don't give your heart. Don't give yourself to them because they will pull you out. God is always concerned. Why is this? Because God is a, a cruel God wants to control us? No, because he wants to bless our lives. 
And he knows it's not going to happen out there. It's only going to happen when you're in his kingdom. Can he really bless you the way he wants to, the way any father wants to bless his child? He wants us to have a great life. He wants us to have a great marriage and a great family and a great future. It's just the kind of God he is. And so he sets us up or he tries to set us up to win and to do great and to have great things happen. It's why in 2 Corinthians 6, he says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk with them and I will be their God. And they will be my people. Therefore come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing. He says, watch what you're touching. You know, everybody's a lot more careful about what they're touching right now, right? With H1N1 running around. You know, I saw a comment about all the high-fiving every yesterday, you know, and it's like, uh-oh, you know. We're a lot more careful. Everybody's buying a lot more sanitizer right now. He's, God says, don't touch things that are unclean. Don't get mixed up. Careful what your eyes are watching. Careful what your ears are hearing. Careful what you're letting influence you. Be careful. They will suck you out and make you just like the world. Or maybe even worse, will make you a worldly Christian. Which in biblical terms is a lukewarm Christian. Which is really worthless because it doesn't get you to heaven. And it doesn't bless you here either. He says, touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. You see God's heart? It's like a father just wants to bring his family together. But he knows us. And he knows this world. So in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, when the church was in trouble, he says, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Don't be deceived. Because we deceive ourselves. We think, I can handle this. I'm okay with this. This won't affect me. I can change myself. He says, do you know that wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor the thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So they're not going in. He says, and what is it? And that is what some of you were. Just to make sure we don't get prideful as Christians. And that we forget where we came from. He says, that is what some of you are, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. And he says, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach, stomach for food. But God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Did you catch that? You know, there was a popular thinking out there in the first century that it doesn't matter what I do with my body. It's my mind that I've given to the Lord. The Lord has my spirit. So what I do with my body doesn't matter. Paul's saying, eh, wrong. What you do with your body has everything to do with this. By his power, God raises the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? That's an intense thought. Shall I then take the members of Christ? And